I'm happy to introduce uh, Jody London, Sustainability Coordinator with the Contra Costa County Department of Conservation and Development, and then also my colleagues at the RCD, Ben Wise, who's our Agriculture Conservation Manager, Derek Emmons, who's our Ag um, Conservation Coordinator, and Mariana, who's also another um, Ag Conservation Coordinator, and um, I'm just so lucky to have these folks um, you know, in my work life. And um, I'm very glad that you are all going to be able to hear about their amazing work. So um, let me make sure that you guys are all co-hosts. Everyone can see the title slide here? Yes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ben Weiss. I'm the Ag Conservation Manager here at Contra Costa RCD. And if you give me a second, I'm going to figure out my Zoom so I can see you all. Good morning. Yeah, we're here to talk to you a little bit about some of the work uh, that's going on in Contra Costa County with regards to agriculture and carbon sequestration and all sorts of fun stuff. With that, I will let Jody take over. She's going to start this presentation for us. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jody London. I'm the sustainability coordinator for Contra Costa County. My role is to oversee implementation of the county's climate action plan. And um, that's a very broad task. I put our website link up earlier because one of the things we staff is our sustainability commission. But we did, um, we're going to talk to you today about a study that's ongoing to look at how we can store carbon in the different land use types in Contra Costa County. Oh, and I just want to say, I apologize in advance that I'm going to have to log off at 11. So I'm, I'm hoping I can, you know, be with you that we'll get through a lot of the questions and all that before then. Can we go to the next slide, please, Ben? So we got a $250,000 Sustainable Agricultural Lands Conservation Grant from the California Department of Conservation. We obtained the grant in partnership with the Resource Conservation District and the UC Cooperative Extension. We brought on RINCON consultants to help us do a lot of the technical analysis. Um, and we've also been partnering with the Carbon Cycle Institute who have a lot of experience in developing these types of strategies. So what's unusual about our study is that we're looking at all of the land use types in Contra Costa County. Usually when someone says, let's talk about carbon farming, they think you mean on a farm. And we're looking at what are all of the places where we can be using our natural and working lands to, um, to capture greenhouse gases and make, make things better for everybody. Um, so you can see here some of the goals for this study, and I'm sure this presentation will be uh, posted online. Can we go to the next slide, please? So um, we did a series of focus groups last year, as well as a survey. The UC Cooperative Extension headed up all of that. We've produced a video that is about to be available online, and we're going to show you a sample of it shortly. Um, we've done this, you know, uh, RINCON has been very busy with the carbon inventory, and Ben's going to tell you about some work he's been doing specific to farms, particularly urban farms, which is really exciting. And right now we're in the process of writing our report, um, and we'll get to that in a sec if we can go to the next slide. Um, so we're coming up, and these, these pictures are from, many of them are from our um, focus groups. But we're looking at what are the different strategies that we can use? How can we protect uh, trees in our more urban areas and, um, and increase the amount of tree cover? And actually, one of the things that I'm looking for in all of the federal grant opportunities that are coming up is funding to develop a tree plan for countywide. Because trees, to me, are a big uh, equity issue as well, particularly when you think about extreme heat. Um, and then we're also hoping that we can use, obviously, reduce emissions and use this as a way to potentially do some joint um, grant opportunities and pursue some joint projects countywide. So that's kind of, these are some of the strategies we're coming up with and things that we're thinking about going forward. And can we go to the next slide, Ben? Uh, so our schedule, right later this week, we expect to receive an administrative draft of this report for review by county staff. And um, to my colleagues in public works, there are so many of you here today. It's great to see you all. If any of you would like to review that administrative draft, please let me know. Uh, we'll be turning that around. And in February, we'll have a public draft of this 
study available. And if any of you would like a presentation on the draft study next month, we're ready to, to take this show on the road and talk with you more about kind of what we're finding. Um, so uh, we also have a website for the project. I'm going to put the link in the chat and you can um, sign up. And when the public review of the draft is available, we'll send an email out to folks. There should be a link there. Um, but our grant ends in March, so we're, we're on that downhill slope to finishing it up and spending the money. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll have all the results that we can all work from. And so, Ben, next slide. Uh, we're going to show you a quick, just the first, the video is about um, 11 minutes. We're going to show you just the first minute and a half or so. California is committed to a sustainable, low carbon and healthier future for its residents while maintaining a robust economy. California's Sustainable Agriculture Lands Conservation Grant Program supports this vision of agricultural conservation, economic growth, and sustainable development. Still, more than a million acres in California were lost to urban land uses and development from 1984 to 2008. Up to 70 times more greenhouse gas emissions come from urban land uses as compared to agriculture. So open space preservation could have the single greatest impact in absorbing carbon emissions. Today, Contra Costa County has over 25,000 acres of farmland. Stewarding agricultural lands and the state's invaluable natural resources is not only central to maintaining our economic vitality, it is also key to meeting our climate goals. The loss of prime farmland could challenge California's economic health. Using climate smart land management practices can address these challenges by storing carbon in plants and the soil. Contra Costa's farmers, ranchers, urban landscape managers, and tree stewards can help identify opportunities for catching carbon, preserving open space, and conserving natural resources. Management practices and policies emerging from your community's participatory input could lead to healthier families, healthier lands, and a healthier Contra Costa. In this video, we are going to show carbon storage opportunities in rangelands, croplands, and urban ag lands, and the relationship between carbon sequestration and climate change. This graph shows... So that's the first, you know, minute and a half of the video. It's in the process of being translated into Spanish, and it will be ultimately be posted on a YouTube channel that you see manages and you can access it and use it anytime in your own, however you like, however it's useful to you. It's one of the products of the grant. We want to make sure that it's publicly available. Um, and you can look at the English version that's on that Google Drive right now. It's publicly open, I believe, as well. Um, yeah, the you know, I'm not going to go there with the pronunciation issues, Elizabeth. I appreciate that, but it was, there's a lot more behind this story than I'm telling you. Um, let's go to the final slide, I think which is just, thank you so much. This is a picture of the Lower Walnut Creek Restoration Project, which uh, is really one of my most favorite projects um, around. So yeah, please check out the project and contact me with any questions. Uh, we're thrilled to be able to highlight this here and we'd love to hear your feedback if there's time. Thanks, I'm gonna hand it off to you, Ben. Good morning again. Uh, again, my name is Ben Weiss. I'm the Ag Conservation Manager here at Contra Costa RCD. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the RCD specific project within this uh, SALT project that we've been working on uh, with Rincon and the UC Cooperative Extension and Jody. Uh, so we, as Jody mentioned earlier, the focus of the SALT grant is looking at where can we put sequestration, where can we sequester carbon on lands in Contra Costa County, just trying to get a whole scale, where's the best place to do that? Within that, uh, the RCD was written in specifically to look at how does this play out in agricultural settings. Um, so, I don't know if it's been talked about in here, or if you're familiar with it, and I apologize for the text, I'm not gonna read it off there. I'll, I'll succinctly uh, sum it up here, but if you don't know or haven't heard of this concept called carbon farming, uh, I like to use uh, the comparison of, you know, you take your car to the mechanic to get a tune-up, um, you know, to make sure everything's running right, everything's running smoothly, everything's running better. 
all farmers by virtue of putting plants in the ground are carbon farmers. They are producing food, they are producing fiber, they are putting carbon into the ground. I like to think as carbon farm plans as the RCD working with these farmers to tune up their operations. So we are looking at opportunities for carbon capture that are gonna address natural resource concerns on their property. So do things like soil health improvement, um, getting more water into the ground, having to use less uh, surface irrigation water, all sorts of good stuff, all through the lens of what are ways we can solve those problems with um, beneficial management practices that sequester carbon. So typically we do that on a one farm scale, which can vary from, as the picture is seen here, three acres, this was out at an urban tilth last year, we wrote a carbon farm plan for them, um, to you know a couple hundred acres for some of the larger ranches. That's about the biggest it tends to get. What we're doing with this study now is more or less doing a carbon farm plan for all of the agricultural lands in Contra Costa County. Uh, so we're looking at the various land use types or the various farm types, what are they growing, um, and just kind of broadly doing a 30,000 foot view of, okay, here's where the agriculture is in Contra Costa County. Here's how, here are the practices that could fit into that. Um, in the picture here, you can see these are the, this is uh, the land fire vegetation classification. So showing mostly where, um, I guess this uh, GIS data set has classified agriculture in Contra Costa County, mostly in Eastern Contra Costa, but then kind of scattered throughout uh, with the rangelands. We'll talk more about that and I've got some better pictures here, but more or less the whole focus of the study is a carbon farm plan for the entirety of Contra Costa County. So first off, what does that mean? What does Contra Costa County agriculture look like? Uh, so I pulled these figures from the 2020 uh, agricultural crop report all told, we're looking at about 6,500 acres of vegetable and seed crops, most of that being in sweet corn and tomatoes. And then after that, it tails off into a bunch of really fun specialty crops. Uh, you got fruit and nut crops at about 4,000 acres. That includes orchards, vineyards, cherries, walnuts, all that good stuff. Uh, field crops is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, this 166,000, that does include 148,000 acres of range reported in 2020. The other 20,000 is various uh, hay, alfalfa, cereal grain, um, and some irrigated pasture land, and then nursery products, uh, all totaling to about 177,000 acres of agriculture in 2020. Uh, that fluctuates year to year, but that's more or less right where we're at. So one of the first steps we took in this project was, okay, we need to figure out what the acreage is. What are we gonna be putting through our process to figure out um, and ultimately arrive at what's the acreage for carbon sequestration opportunities. So I apologize for all these acronyms. I'll explain what this all means, but this is a table showing the various sources we as a project team encountered of reports for agricultural land in Contra Costa County. So FMMP is the Farmland Mapping and Monitoring Program that's run by the California Department of Conservation. Uh, we report up to them. They collect all that information at the statewide level and use that data set then to give to policymakers to inform larger trends. It's a really good data set, but it does not include, it includes anything that could be potential agricultural land. So there's a lot of rangeland that isn't grazed that gets included in this. Uh, likewise, we already talked about the 2020 crop report that's managed by the Agri uh, Contra Costa Department of Agriculture. Uh, they gave us some figures there. Uh, but ultimately, what we ended up using for the uh, product, just because it seemed to sync better with uh, what RingCon was using for the larger um, carbon capture study, uh, was this product called Landfire. So Landfire is a GIS product that um, more or less classifies vegetation based on its type um, at about a 30 meter resolution, I think, across the entire United States. So we looked at that. Uh, here in the county and compared it ultimately to the 2020 crop report felt that you know it's a little off but it's close enough it's in the ballpark it's enough to give us some figures here uh, but ultimately we use these numbers here cultivated land and field crops at 27,000 orchards and vineyards at about 4,000 um, yeah and then the last thing we needed was this urban agriculture which is a new and emerging thing that Derek and Mariana are going to talk a little bit more about but no one's really tracking that so uh, together with UC Co-op Extension, we put our heads together, wrote down all the urban farms, community gardens, school farms, um, anything that has plants in it, more or less, or vegetables or uh, fruit, more or less, uh, to try and arrive at some estimation of total acreage in Contra Costa County. 
probably an underestimate, but right now we think it's about 72 acres. So from that then, now that we have our acreage and our understanding of what the setting we're playing in is, we needed to figure out what management practices are farmers most interested in. Um, I have a picture here of a really big, ugly spreadsheet that we all used. You can see Wade Finlinson's name if you have really good eyesight. Thanks, Wade, for jumping in on this project with us. But we more or less pulled a couple of uh, project partners to kind of get their sense on all sorts of management practices that could be applied or could be used by farmers here in Contra Costa County. We also used historical data from um, healthy soils program applications that the RCD assisted on. So these are projects that the RCD went out, sat down with a farmer, talked about management practices with, with management practices with them, and then sketched out the actual acreage for, okay, we're going to put cover crops on this field, and then we're going to put a hedgerow on this edge and a windbreak on this edge. So it was based in actual application data, actual implementation data. Combine that actual data with kind of our theoretical model, um, and then as well as looking at practices that we're like, there's no way anyone's going to do this just because it's not economically effective for them to do. It costs too much. It involves taking too much land out of production. Um, we combined all of that together to kind of figure out, okay, what are the practices we're really interested in modeling and figuring out what is the total potential here in Contra Costa County to sequester carbon on farmland. So then with our practices in hand and our acreage, it, then we have a tool uh, that we use in carbon farming called Comet Planner. It was developed by um, Colorado State and the NRCS, I believe. But basically, all of the management practices that the NRCS uses and that we use talking with these farmers has some value that they have researched and developed and synthesized. Uh, so basically you input an acreage, it multiplies it by a factor and it gives you the amount of carbon that's going to be stored as a result of that practice on that acreage. So based on that, we just needed the total implementation acreage for all of these practices. So we did, uh, to figure that out, we kind of went about it two different ways. The first, we went with uh, some GIS analysis to, uh, when, when it was possible. Um, some of these practices are subject to uh, various constraints, uh, you know, slope constraints, access constraints, availability constraints. Um, so anything we could do in GIS to arrive at an acreage, we did. Um, this map is really tiny here, but this was our analysis of uh, where can we even put compost application on rangelands if we really wanted to in Contra Costa County. Um, so these are the various, the colors you see, it's very small, I apologize, are various uh, grass types in the county. The end result of what we found was that by and large, there's a lot of potential to put uh, compost out on these rangelands, but it's really hard to get to them. So it's probably not going to happen. Um, I don't know if we can pay a compost truck to drive up, you know, Morgan Territory Road right now or something to that effect, or even on some old ranch roads or something. So we tried to factor that in where appropriate. Uh, another example of how we use GIS here. So this is the same, it's a similar map to what you just saw, but this is looking at where riparian restoration could happen in Contra Costa County rangelands. So really you're looking at two colors here. There's a blue and it's probably your best to focus down on here. Um, and these maps will all be in our report if you're really inclined to read it. But what we did was we ran, okay, where is the intersection of riparian areas with uh, the land fire database? And then from there, we were able to figure out, okay, what has existing woody cover and what doesn't have existing woody cover? and then use that areas without woody cover to figure out, okay, that's probably a prime candidate for riparian restoration. So if you look in this map down here in the bottom, this brown area more or less is where we think there are specific areas that we could potentially do riparian restoration, which is a great carbon sequestration capture on rangeland settings in particular. So ultimately that spits out an acreage number for us, which then we use to model. Um, the other way we went about this where it's a little harder to figure out, okay, what's the implementation acreage was we just, um, we used some of that historical data from the Healthy Soils Program application to figure out, okay, if I go out and visit a 10 acre farm, more or less on average, about eight or seven and a half or eight acres of that farm gets enrolled in cover crops, or we recommend it gets enrolled in cover crops. The other two acres may be roads going through the property or uh, drainage ditches or other areas where it's just not feasible, not really worth doing the cover cropping management practice. So 
it's not one-to-one, -one, but what we did was we arrived at these implementation coefficients, which you can see listed here. These are just a couple, um, which we then used to draw down and get to our total implementation acreage. So all of this table is based on just a hypothetical 10 area or 10 acre orchard. Um, you know, a hedgerow installation is really only going to be about two tenths of an acre. It's not an entire 10 acres, right? So we use that to run through our models uh, to arrive at some totals. So then uh, some early results of this, again, like I said, to walk you through what we did, we arrived at the, okay, here's the total farm acreage. And then we uh, decreased that to find, okay, what's the total implementation acreage? And then we run that number through Comet Planner, which is what you see here, this first column. And then it spits out on the right, uh, a potential annual carbon dioxide sequestered estimate in uh, milligram or megagrams of carbon dioxide per year. So what that means is that if we were to fully implement cover cropping, for instance, on the 19,000 acres that we think it's possible in Contra Costa County, that would result in about 7,600 metric ton or yeah, our mega megagrams, metric tons of carbon dioxide sequestered every single year. Um, of course, that's with 100% adoption. And if everyone wants to give me money to make sure that happens, I'd love to take it and get it out there on those farms, but that's expensive. So what we did, and I'll flip through this really quick, but you can see we did it for the row crop here. We did it for some orchards as well and some of the management practices that are ongoing there could suitably work there. We did it specifically looking at urban agriculture and urban farms, again, based on some of the historical data we have from applications there. And then likewise, uh, some of the grazing management practices that we recommend. So all of these figures, while it's really tempting to sum that all up and say, you know what, if we fully implemented this, there's 200,000 tons of carbon dioxide here. It's great, but that's not necessarily accurate. A lot of these practices do overlap. Sometimes farmers are having to choose one or the other, so it doesn't really make sense to add those all together. So where the team is at right now, and I don't really have much more to show, is that we're starting to get into some scenario planning. So from that, and I think Wade helped us out on this and some other folks, we sat down together as a team, used some of the surveys that Jody mentioned as part of our focus groups and the workshop data to figure out, okay, what is the current adoption rate for these practices? You know, is it low, medium, or high? And then what do those figures mean? So we broke that down and created this table here. And now we're starting to play around with, uh, okay, what does a low adoption rate in cover cropping mean? Is that 5%? Is that 10%? Uh, there's a lot of room for <laughs> figuring this all out here, but trying to figure out, okay, can we take those numbers that I just showed you and shrink that down and arrive at some figures? So playing around with that, you can see here, I just highlighted for you the row crop systems just to see what that looks like. Uh, we're looking at uh, assuming a low adoption rate of about 5%, a medium adoption rate of 25%, and a high adoption rate of about 50%. So based on the practices that we talked about, the estimated maximum potential of with 100% adoption, we then just multiply that by 0 0.05, 0 0.25, or 0 0.5 to arrive at what we think could feasibly be happening. So based on all of that data we have and then the scenario we're looking at here, Right now, we figured out that under this scenario, if we implemented, you know, cover cropping at about 50%, mulching down at about 5%, I won't go through all of it, but all of that together, that works out to about 12,000 tons of carbon dioxide sequestered annually, which if you don't know, that's about 2,600 gasoline powered vehicles being operated for a full year. So there's some real benefit here to this work and making these, getting these practices out of the landscape. Um, there's a lot of potential. Um, and, you know, it may, it's hard to wrap your head around this. I feel it's small, but I always, it's important to recommend or to remind myself that, yeah, while well, that's small, we're also producing food and fiber here. This is part of our food system. We're getting other products from this. We're getting other value-added stuff from it as well. Um, but it can also play an important role in helping sequester carbon dioxide. So as I mentioned, the team is continuing to butt heads and figure out, okay, how do we do this scenario planning? What do all these numbers mean before we arrive at kind of our final conclusion and our recommendations here? I don't think I included, I didn't, um, but that's where we're at. So we'll be wrapping that up here shortly. And I imagine getting that up on the project site as well. Um, as Jody mentioned, if you want me to come and talk about this, I'd be happy to, to shorten this a little bit and not take up a whole 15 minutes, but 
maybe not feel so technical too, but happy to talk about our work and what we're doing and try to get more support for getting these practices out on the ground. With that, I will turn it over to Derek. Cool. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, and thank you, Jody and Ben, for uh, both your work and overview of carbon sequestration planning processes uh, with our working lands. Um, so over the next over the next ten to twelve minutes, uh, we'll take a closer look at uh, urban agriculture as a mechanism of restoring ecological and social well-being and provide a small glimpse of the diversity of urban farm and garden operations within Contra Costa County, um, as well as our own processes of providing technical assistance. Uh, next slide, please. So urban farms and gardens within a watershed context. Um, ultimately, working lands in general are cultivated or grazed areas within floodplains or mid-hill regions. And due to the intensity of land use of, of, of industrial agriculture, um, the, the conservation work practiced by and in partnership with farmers can have uh, amplified effects on the quality of downstream habitats and uh, quality of life for neighboring human communities. So conservation agriculture, as you can guess, is a practice of cultivating food and fiber in ways that preserve, conserve, restore um, our soil fertility, air and water quality, and native habitats uh, through many of the practices that Ben just described um, you know, in the urban farm planning process. Um, it's inclusive, but not quite synonymous to sustainable agriculture, organic, regenerative, permaculture, or agroecological farming. And urban farms and gardens within our metropolitan Bay Area tend to practice conservation ag, um, but they function on smaller acreage than rural farms and ranches. Uh, they tend to be multifunctional spaces and tend to have much higher numbers of people uh, in a more, in a more uh, diverse range of people coming in and out of these areas. So some of the ecological or hydrological benefits, um, you know, urban farms and gardens serve as islands of open space and habitat within otherwise concrete, uh, physically traumatized floodplains. Um, and by integrating food crops with native plants, pollinator plants, um, fruit trees, uh, these complex and diverse habitat pockets are able to sustain regional biodiversity by providing corridors and refugia for wildlife um, from songbirds, pollinators, and more. Um, you know, as we're seeing now with infrequent but torrential rains, they can also serve as stormwater infiltration locations. Um, and they also serve as carbon sinks via, you know, the on-site composting, mulch, cover crops, and perennial plants. You know, and then there's, uh, you know, the social, cultural, psychological benefits of, you know, of these urban oasises, um, you know, that many of these locations serve as community hubs or gathering sites uh, where, where numerous people can have access to open space and um, an agency with land stewardship. I wouldn't say that urban agriculture is synonymous with being historically underserved as, pro as producers range from being highly resourced to those experiencing generational poverty. Yet urban agriculture has been an entry or a re-entry point for many folks, um, especially those who have been historically excluded and or oppressed uh, to cultivate these common spaces. You know, and that the diversity of cultural relationships with land and approaches to conservation opens up more pathways forward in terms of achieving our collective restoration goals. 
So from school gardens to farms with good signage um, and workshops, uh, these spaces engage and activate individuals to expand knowledge or deepen understanding of agroecological systems, watersheds, sciences, and arts. Um, in addition to providing core benefits of food production, uh, food justice, um, you know, and just being a space that folks who catch a breath, clear the mind, and connect. So looking at the diversity of operate, ooh, yes, thank you. Um, so looking at the diversity of operations, um, while there's a running list of general benefits, I don't want to frame urban ag as a monolith, um, you know, because operations range from community and school gardens, food justice oriented nonprofits, for profit businesses, churches and temples, and everything in between. So when it comes to conservation technical assistance and project implementation, um, you know, one shoe does not fit all. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, but for some of the funding sources, um, a significant portion of my work is leveraging a range of grants and community networks uh, to support producers in identifying, planning, and implementing their conservation goals. Uh, Kathy Cuddy mentioned um, a success of 2022 was establishing um, a eco-cultural restoration, uh, restoration garden in partnership with Cal State East Bay, um, East Bay and Remsen Ohlone leaders, as well as CCRCD staff, um, as well as receiving a farm to school grant that allowed us to uh, conduct um, food system education and um, bring 95 elementary and middle school students out to the North Richmond uh, Urban Tilth Farm. Yet many of the current federal and state agriculture grants prioritize larger farms, as well as secure land tenure and conventional agribusiness models. So many urban agriculture producers haven't had access to many of these funding pools. So that's where some of the nonprofit programs like the Xerxes Society Monarch Habitat Kits have been an accessible means to acquire native plants for hedgerows and has allowed us to maintain working partnerships with producers who might otherwise slide between the cracks. In 2021, uh, Lisa Demerell and I helped facilitate planting uh, four sites. Uh, this past year in 2022, um, you know, the CCRCD conducted outreach, encouraged applications, um, and actively planted with nine different sites throughout the county, seven of which are urban agriculture operations. Um, and, you know, that ended up resulting in more than 1,200 plants in the ground. Hopefully they're getting well watered right now. Um, so, Betty Reed Soskin Middle School, um, if you all have heard of this place in El Sobrante, is a pretty unique site as uh, this past January, they converted their baseball field into a food producing and education oriented farm. Uh, and so CCRCD staff was able to provide 120 students and two teachers an overview of biodiversity and soil conservation um, prior to physically planting these hydro kids on the hillside. Um, next slide, please. You know, next we have Sigorite Land Trust and Agroecology Commons, where uh, Sigorite is an East Bay Ohlone-led uh, organization that reconnects urban indigenous folks to land stewardship through the process of rematriation. Uh, and Agroecology Commons is a nonprofit that facilitates farmer-to-farmer -farmer trainings, uh, advocates for food sovereignty, and organizes networks of cooperation. Uh, both organizations border a perennial creek and receive mixed riparian and dryland species, uh, you know, such as um, California buckwheats, 
uh, blue elderberry and more. Um, so roughly 45 people showed up for planting day and were fed uh, both before, during, and after work. Next slide, please. Um, so now we're getting to Pittsburgh Bay Point, where the Healthy Hearts Institute was founded by Ray Hearts, whose mission centers on mental, physical wellness and poverty alleviation for the community living within the El Pueblo housing projects. Um, and has established a two-acre farm and community garden. Uh, Ray's staff, as well as Anne Drevo, who's here today, uh, rallied St. Mary's College student volunteers to prepare and plant hedgerow strips. Um, and as for Bay, Bay Point's Ambrose Community Garden, um, you know, this pocket-sized oasis serves uh, neighborhood families and the local Head Start preschool. Um, and the hetero's uh, multifunctionality uh, included being a sound and windbreak from the neighboring four lane road. Next slide, please. And last but not least, um, over in Brentwood, uh, we have the Chow family um, or Chan Strawberry Stand. Uh, who cultivates mixed strawberries and Southeast Asian vegetables. Um, and it's bordered by housing development, commercial businesses, and the Marsh Creek Corridor. And uh, this was a pretty special moment where, with the helping hands of 35 volunteers from Future Farmers of America, two local high schools, Boy Scout Troop 93, Friends of Marsh Creek, uh, we were able to plant two hedgerow kits and five donated oaks, um, as well as mulch, um, you know, along the creek corridor. And so this planting was an opportunity to um, contextualize the interconnections of soil conservation, riparian restoration uh, with agricultural heritage. Um, and it served as a reminder of the importance of community support. Um, to implement conservation goals within our urban and suburban landscape. Next slide, please. So I like to say work in process, you know, work, rather than work in progress, just because, you know, it's all, you know, ongoing processes, right? Um, so from the initial outreach and connection um, with, on the ground partners to coordination with uh, agency partners such as UC Cooperative, site visits. Um, I do my best to acknowledge and observe the work that folks are already doing on the ground, um, conduct on site needs assessments, and have open dialogues about multiple options to address farmer needs. Um, I'm imperfect, but I aim to listen, reflect, and connect, not necessarily in that order, um, and center respect for producers who already have a lot on their plate. Um, offering some sweat equity is a good way to get to know one another um, and a way to remember my own positionality, uh, my own accountability, and authenticity matters for cultivating these working relationships and moving, uh, moving together towards these common goals. So trust building and liaison work are difficult to quantify to grantors, um, but from a community organizing perspective, this builds collective capacity for more resilient conservation outcomes. Um, we're not just going to plant it and leave. Um, you know, it, it's an ongoing relationship um, to care for, you know, these hedgerows or these restored plots of land. Um, or a metaphor related to long-term soil fertility and, you know, and community relations. Um, I like to think of relationship building as expansion of symbiotic fungal networks and roots, uh, which is kind of a long-term unseen 
yet necessary process that comes before we see the flowers and taste the fruit. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just kind of wrapping up, um, you know, this is where I feel the importance of urban agriculture to watershed scale restoration uh, that connects the riparian corridors to the floodplains, to the hills. Um, you know, it provides the conditions in which we see the positive changes that our own behavior has on the diversity and abundance of life around us. And whether or not individual farms and gardens are preserved over the long run, um, the practice of connecting people and engaging people around social ecological well being uh, reinforces an enduring movement towards whole relationships with the land and one another. Um, so, you know, yeah, thanks for listening, and I'll pass it to Mariana. Man, whose idea was it to have me go after Derek every single time? Um, joking, but also not really joking. Um, that was really wonderful, Derek. Thanks for sharing. Um, and just a big shout out and acknowledgement to the CCRCD team that I work with. Um, the type of work that gets done here and, and the support that happens is pretty unique um, and greatly appreciated. Um, but I'll go into that later. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Mariana Savala. I have been on the CCRCD team since March of this past year. Um, I'm also an Ag Conservation Coordinator working alongside Derek and Ben. Um, and I'm gonna be following up a, a little bit on what both Ben and Derek have covered in, in their presentation pieces. Um, I I'm gonna be zooming out to the big picture with y'all today and then and then zooming back in, um, which I think is really, really great considering all uh, that has been shared in the past, you know, 20, 30 minutes. Um, so quick overview, um, we're gonna be taking a bigger picture look um, at the state of statewide ag in California. Um, we're gonna be chatting about the RCD's role in agriculture and conservation. Um, the Contra Costa RCD's current work, um, and then you know what are we looking forward to and moving towards? Um, so just to preface um, with the zooming out and also the looking back, I think that in terms of the work that we do in the communities that we collaborate with, it's really important to know where you're coming from in order to move forward. Um, and oftentimes, and I would probably say most of the time, um, that includes some really uncomfortable and downright painful truths, um, but that doesn't make it any less valuable or um, key to this process. So um, I do name several sources in the next few slides. Uh, please note it's not an exhaustive list, uh, an expansive report, or something that should be published in a newspaper article, just things that I have pulled for the purpose of the presentation. Um, and then like Derek before me, the lens of this work is largely focused on BIPOC producers and urban producers. Um, and there's a lot of overlap between those two terms and the communities that we work with. Um, and then while this presentation is focused on ag, there are very few degrees of separation between conservation and ag. And the more that those two things are de-siloed, the better. Um, like Derek said throughout his previous presentation, you know, everything is connected. Um, and so keeping that in mind as well. Um, next slide, please, Ben. So some terminology and um, apologies if this is very familiar to this group already. Um, you know, just coming back to work this week and being in meetings and being with, with people again, um, it's been important for me to recenter myself in this work. And there are, is particular terminology that we use that. It, that matters, words are important. Um, and so you'll hear me use the term BIPOC, which stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. Um, you know, we use this term in our workplace currently because it enables a shift away from words like marginalized or minority communities. Um, and specifically, it centers the discrimination and violence experienced in the most impactful way by Black and Indigenous communities. Um, 
you know, like a lot of umbrella terms, it is imperfect, but it's the one that we use and um, everything is a work in progress. Um, similar to the above term, um, but maybe a bit more clinical in sense, underserved and socially disadvantaged producers, a lot of y'all are probably, probably really familiar with this. It's commonly used throughout a lot of grant language, particularly in the last few years. Um, but according to the CDFA, um, and also pulled from the uh, Pharma Equity Report, which was done in 2017, um, an underserved or socially disadvantaged producer is a farmer or rancher who is a member of a socially disadvantaged group. That means a group whose members have been subjected to racial, ethnic, or gender discrimination. Um, and then on the topic of farmers and ranchers, we also use the term land stewards a lot in our work. Um, farmers and ranchers are landowners really denotes the ownership of a piece of property. And overall, I think we are shifting away from using those words because ownership is complex and nuanced and also deeply rooted in a variety of injustices and prejudices. Um, and for many of the folks that we work with in the urban farming community aren't landowners, but they do consider themselves land stewards. So. Next slide. Okay, so zooming out, um, my very brief review of the state of California agriculture, please denote my earlier comment of this should not go in a newspaper article, um, so bear with me. Um, I do want to acknowledge a lot of this information is pulled from Community Alliance with, with Family Farmers, the California Farmer Justice Collaborative, um, the CDFA 2020 Farmer Equity Report, and then AB 1348, which is also known as the Farmer Equity Act. Um, and for those of you who don't know much about it, um, if you have questions, feel free to ask me at the end. Um, some history, not all things are created equal. Um, I was feeling really salty last night and I put another sentence there that said, actually nothing is created equal, but I got rid of that. Um, keeping a little more upbeat for the new year. Um, and then, you know, the words that I put below this are, are things I think that really resonate with me and Derek and others in this space and with the communities that we work with is California agriculture is amazing in so many ways. Um, California agriculture feeds the world and it also has a long, deeply racist, deeply flawed past and present. Um, and that's acknowledging that is part of the piece of looking forward into how we can do better work. Um, Jumping back to the Farmer Equity Act or AB 1348 really quickly. Um, this was signed into law in October, 2017 by assembly member Cecilia Aguiar Curry. Um, and it was legislation specifically focused on language in particular. Um, and it recognized that California's farmers and ranchers were made up and are made up of a diverse group of people. And not all have historically had access to resources and information or to successfully run their businesses. This group of farmers and ranchers is considered socially disadvantaged and has faced historical discrimination, much of which still exists today. Um, the additional purpose of AB 1348 um, was to help direct the CDFA to better provide resources, outreach, technical assistance, and decision-making power to these said growers. Um, another note on this particular slide, um, and this is a quote pulled directly from a report done by the California Farmer Justice Collaborative in response to the CDFA Farmer Equity Act. And in particular, something that was stated on CDFA's homepage. Um, CDFA has existed since 1919. It has been over a hundred years since California legislature created the state's single department tasked with protecting and promoting agriculture for our state. The department's website states, California's agricultural abundance is a reflection of the people who made the Golden State their home. Early California farmers and ranchers were Spanish missionaries followed by Mexicans, Japanese, Chinese, and Russians. Today, nearly every nationality is represented in California agriculture. I'm gonna push pause on that real quick and say that um, all of that may be true, but it's also a very convenient statement that leaves out a lot of the past and the harm. Um, and that's putting it lightly. Um, going back to the quote, as joyous as this token of diversity is, 
the Farmer Equity Act is meant to play a role in acknowledging the history lost between these words, dispossession of native lands, the broken promise to black farmers, the Dust Bowl, the Bracero program, alien land laws, Japanese internment, to name a few of the ways that California's history has systematically worked against the elusive promise of farming for socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. Um, next slide, please. So that brief overview and that context in mind, um, what does California agriculture look like today and right now? Um, so you can see a couple different screenshots I pulled from both the 2012 census and then the 2017 ag census. Um, this is also pulled from the California Farmer Equity Act report. Um, California leads the nation in the diversity of its farmers and ranchers. Um, and between 2007 and 2012, it experienced the largest increase of Asian American farmers of any state. Um, and even though the number of farms decreased over the past few years, the number of Latine operated farms simultaneously increased. Um, and today California ranks third in the nation in concentration of Latine farmers in comparison to statewide, only 3% of farmers and farm owners are Latine. Um, so something to note that despite this growth, farmers of color earn less money on average and according to the report, receives 36% less in government funding than their white counterparts. This is a huge issue. Um, and I think something else to note is that these numbers are also probably largely underrepresented. Reporting to the USDA isn't something most folks do because there's multiple layers of trust that have been eroded between underrepresented and historically disenfranchised farmers and government entities. Um, so while these numbers are interesting to look at, I would, I would have cause to say that they're probably pretty low still. Um, next slide, please, Ben. Oh, go back one, por favor. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So that additional context in mind, um, through the work that we do here at the RCD, through our involvement with other agencies, our collaborations with grassroots groups, our work with farmers and land stewards, et cetera. Um, there are some pretty significant needs that have risen to the surface over the past few years. Um, and in particular, while they may apply to a lot of farmers in the state of California, socially disadvantaged farmers and BIPOC farmers are impacted the most by these challenges and therefore their need is the greatest. Um, so I just want to keep that lens in mind. Um, and this is pulled from National Young Farmers Coalition, Community Alliance with Family Farmers, and our own knowledge as well. Um, what are the greatest challenges and needs of BIPOC and socially disadvantaged farmers? Number one is access to land. Um, and this might not be news to folks, um, but it's gotten to the point where this is the biggest brick wall for people. And to tag in the RCD's presence and work in this space. This is something that we are really hoping to try and address um, in our own part and see in what ways we can move forward to support the land stewards that we work with. Um, some additional challenges and needs of producers are drought, climate change and sustainable ag solutions, language and culturally appropriate technical assistance and beginning farmer training and educational resources. Um, and just because the urban farmers that we work with might be working on an acre, a quarter of an acre, a backyard, a community garden, doesn't make any of these needs less severe. Um, let's see. Go ahead and go to the next slide then, thank you. So bringing it back down from that big wide lens that's rather sobering and rightfully so, um, looking at our RCD level and our work, um, part of looking at our past and our participation in these systems is once again, key to our work moving forward. Um, and so for folks that don't know, RCDs were formed in a time when discriminatory practices were being codified into law at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, and historically, the RCDs have largely been focused on assisting white landowners. Um, and 
this work has perpetuated the systemic inequities and racism in the system. And so one of the things that we as an RCD, and I'm not gonna speak for the RCD network as a whole, because what I know is the coworkers that I share space with and the work that we do, um, is that there's a lot of deep internal and external work taking place to move towards equity. Um, and as an RCD with relationships with multiple stakeholders in the state and the influence that we have and, and the current connections with land stewards is, is we have an opportunity to play an important role in coordinating statewide efforts to increase inclusion in agriculture. Um, but that work has to start at home first before it can ex extend outwards. Um, so some, just to name a couple things that we've been working on on our side, um, folks on this call and at the RCD participate in the, a statewide level JEDI committee under California Association of Resource Conservation Districts. That committee is currently in the process of creating a charter that is voluntary, but the goal is that statewide RCDs can become involved in the charter to help increase equity in their programs and both internally with their staff. Um, we do internal DEI work and like Derek so eloquently put in his presentation, um, we incorporate a lot of mindfulness into our work. So next slide, please. Bringing it back down to the original thing that I was supposed to talk about, but I had to zoom out before I could even begin to tackle this. Um, one of the things that we're really excited about with our current work is an awarded grant that came from NRCS, uh, the Racial Justice and Equity Conservation Cooperative Agreements. This was a grant we were awarded this past year. Um, a handful of RCDs applied um, and CARCD applied as a block grant. Um, this was an NRCS grant that had, I believe, 50 million available uh, nationwide. And so one of the things that was really exciting to us about this opportunity uh, was that while not perfect, it removed some of the pretty classic barriers that exist in providing funding for producers. Um, and Derek specifically, as someone who has worked with a lot of the urban farmers and done their best to ch channel that funding to folks, um, you know, we still had a handful of folks who didn't receive healthy soils funding for a variety of reasons. They're a nonprofit, um, they don't meet uh, certain qualifications, et cetera. And so it, it, you know, it continues to be that perpetuation of, of the gap in assistance in the systemic inequalities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, oh, I just got signed out of my document. I'll just keep going and wing it. So we got awarded this project. Um, it's a two-year agreement, and the goal is to expand the delivery of conservation assistance to socially disadvantaged, beginning, and limited resource farmers. Um, while this grant is still very much in progress for us, uh, we wanted to share a little bit about the vision for this awarded funding. Um, and essentially what we want to do is hold a workshop series for urban and BIPOC farmers in the East Bay, um, as well as aspiring farmers. Um, and some of the things that we've really tried to key in on are the process of putting on this workshop series. I think that a lot of folks on this call and a lot of folks in the RCD network can probably put on a workshop in the blink of an eye. Um, however, when it comes to working with the communities that we work with, um, a lot of folks say the work only moves at the rate of trust that you build. And we do not wanna come from a place as a historically and largely white organization um, and say, hey, we have this funding, we're gonna teach you about these subjects. Um, we're really coming at this workshop series and this grant funding um, and trying to look at these land stewards as partners and stakeholders in this game um, and not coming at it from a, we're gonna educate you and then we're gonna leave. Um, how is this the blueprint for our work? I, I think a couple of things, um, obviously our workshops are not scheduled yet, but looking at 
the farmers that we work with as partners in this work. This came specifically as feedback from someone at CAF that we connected with. Um, they said, hey, listen, you know, a lot of these farmers are being asked a lot of already. Um, and it's one thing if it's a farmer with, you know, lots of acreage, multiple revenue sources, um, you know, has government funding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's another thing if you're asking time and energy of folks who probably aren't being paid to do this work, are depending heavily on volunteer hours, um, and are facing a barrage of, of challenges. Um, and so as far as this workshop series goes, approaching it in an equitable manner, making sure that we have funding for speakers, making sure that we have funding for hosts, making sure that we have funding for travel stipends for folks. Um, you know, one of the biggest barriers that I've seen in the past year working with folks is that, you know, if it requires driving somewhere, a lot of the black and brown farmers that I work with and are my friends don't even have a car. Like, I'm not gonna go to that event. Why would I do that? Um, and so you can see how quickly people and communities fall through the gaps. Um, so the funding has been a big portion of it. Um, I'll go ahead and skip to the next slide. So looking forward, um, Contra Costa RCD is constantly having internal discussions about how we can become better technical assistance providers. Um, echoing back to what Derek commented about in terms of roots before the fruit. Um, listening first and understanding what we are fully capable of offering. Um, I think some things that have come up as big needs for us in terms of the producers that we work with, um, you know, go back to that challenge of land access. We find that, yes, we can help folks implement, you know, sustainable ag-based practices, conservation-based practices, but it's not going to matter if there's no land for people to steward, if there's no pipeline for people to, to move from, you know, aspiring farmer to current farmer to teaching others, et cetera. Um, and so really kind of honing in on how as an RCD, we can impact creating an opportunity for secure land tenure for BIPOC farmers. Um, zoning and policy education is another one. Uh, lease agreements is a huge one and then um, culturally appropriate technical, technical assistance. Um, and then, you know, two big ones, trust and collaboration. Uh, and then as far as what is currently in motion, um, the proposed budget came out yesterday. I don't know if folks saw it, uh, but there were some pretty big cuts made to some programs that have been pretty uh, important to our work as an RCD and other RCDs work as well. Um, there were, multi-million dollar cuts to the Health of Soils program, to beginning farmer and rancher development program, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, the office of the governor, governor is trying to make up for um, a loss in budget. However, I think it goes to show that this kind of work remains paramount. Um, and the advocacy and the amount of collaboration and community building that happens is gonna remain really, really key to support supporting urban farmers and BIPOC producers in Contra Costa County. Um, that's it from me. I appreciate y'all hanging in and feel free to ask us any questions. Thank you all so much. Um, I am blown away as always um, by your presentations and um, I will open it up to questions in a moment. I know we've lost a few people because they had to go to other meetings and I know we only have uh, technically only have 10 more minutes for questions, but um, I will leave the meeting open for a little bit longer if folks want, if folks have questions. Um, but first, just want to let you know that um, our next forum planning committee meeting, um, which is open to anyone who's interested, will take place on Zoom on January 24th, uh, noon to one. And then if you'd like to participate in that and don't already receive planning committee meeting notifications, please let me know and I can add you to the list. And then the next full forum meeting will take place on Zoom on March 8th, uh, 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. Um, so thank you for uh, listening to those announcements. 
Um, again, just thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I think it's somewhat common for folks to think about creeks and watersheds as separate from agriculture, and our, your presentations remind us that we need to have a more holistic view of watersheds. Um, and the carbon sequestration practices, you know, implemented on farms and other land types have multiple benefits, including, you know, improving water quality and availability, uh, limiting harmful runoff into our waterways and preventing local flooding. So, you know, whenever anybody's like, well, what does this have to do with our creeks or our water? Those are some pretty hardcore ways that it can affect it. Um, and so I guess I'll start us off I, with a question for, I guess it's a question for Ben or, or really anyone who wants to take it. Um, I know that one of the important elements of carbon farm plans is restoration of disturbed lands. Um, about how much of that, um, at least in the lands that you guys are looking at, is restoring riparian areas? Because it seems to me like a lot of the farms, even some of the farms that you guys talked about today, um, are either directly um, bordering a, a creek um, or close by to one. Um, and then if that's not really an answerable question, uh, maybe could you give an example of a situation where a creek or a riparian area has been involved in a carbon farm plan? Yeah, I'm going to let Derek, do you want to answer that and talk maybe in the urban farm context? And then I can talk about uh, maybe some of our Brentwood area farms in just a second here. Good. Okay. Yeah, because the urban ag sites kind of range all sorts of locations. I mean, just off the top of my head, um, family harvest farm, you know, over in Pittsburgh, uh, you know, they're adjacent to a seasonal riparian zone. Um, and there's plans to do some restoration work there through the carbon farm plan. Um, otherwise, like, you know, urban tilth in Richmond, you know, has a riparian zone. Um, you know, but a lot of these areas that do have access, it you know, they tend to be seasonal rather than perennial streams. Sorry, did that answer the question? Yeah, I mean, I think it just it just shows that a lot of the folks who are doing this work are either you know right next to a creek or have a creek running through their property, and and that it means that you know while um, a lot of us probably don't work on uh, creeks that are on farms. Um, it's very much a thing and it's something that, you know, farmers and, and RCD folks and stuff think about. Um, and it just goes back to like the multi-benefit, um, nature of all the projects that we can do, right? If you put in a hedgerow, it's helpful for the farm. It's helpful for the vegetation uh, around the Creek. It's helpful for the pollinators. It's helpful for all kinds of different things. So it's, it's just that going back to that holistic, um, view. Right. Like having a, you know, a few of the farms and school gardens have swales and infiltration, mm -hmm. like rain gardens, like, you know, and even though they're not, you know, within a mile of a creek per se, you know, that all, that's all groundwater, right? And yeah, to, definitely. to shift it over to more of our, um, I guess, traditional farm is what I'll call it. Um, we found, and it's one of the limitations of our study, that the nexus for riparian restoration is fairly limited. Um, so all of these blue lines come from a data set that shows us where the streams and creeks are in eastern Contra Costa County. Um, all of them are straight, you can see. So those are actually all canals or irrigation ditches, uh, not actual you know, native creeks or riparian channels. Really, in eastern Contra Costa, you've only got Marsh Creek, which just kind of meanders here along the edge and then also Kellogg Creek, which comes down here. So there is some nexus, but it is, a uh, we aren't able, we don't have the data to figure out an acreage. So it's a bit of a limiting factor of our project. There's certainly opportunity, but probably in this type of setting, uh, fairly limited, but in the urban setting, I feel like every urban farm we've worked with is right up against a creek. So, and sometimes there's just those seasonal unnamed creeks, uh, which also don't make it to our data set either, but. When it does come around, you know, that's one of our big practices we like to recommend because it's just so multi-benefit. Um, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, hopefully we can gather more data on that so that we can um, work on that more. Um, 
but in, in, the, in yeah. my or rangeland settings though there is tremendous potential right. we showed that map earlier but that again yeah. you get into access issues and a lot of that is healthy native creek that given time we'll probably get to uh where it needs to go anyway so it's a little bit of a do we let mother nature take over or do we go in and try to speed things up by 10 or 20 years so <laughs> but right that's one yeah. of our favorite things to recommend absolutely great thank you um paula uh, yeah, my question has to do with the uh, strategy to secure land tenure for BIPOC farmers, and I'm thinking specifically of some of the underutilized parcels in North Richmond. Um, the ownership is, a, I, I, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, I, I'm wondering if if you've reached out to the Richmond Land Trust or if you have any plans to kind of look at that community. Yeah. Um... Paula, I think that's a great question. I think one of the things uh, that is important for me and, and also for our ag team to be mindful of is that we're relatively new in that space and don't have much knowledge in regards to things like land leases, uh, zoning policy, et cetera. And so in moving towards this work and how we can better support land access, we're gonna be leaning heavily on folks like California Farm Link, like Kitchen Table Advisors, um, people that have that knowledge. Um, and there is currently work happening in this space. And so I think as of right now, it's more a matter of what do we as an RCD have to offer those folks implementing that work? And then, you know, if there's something that we can incorporate and expand on our own end, that would be kind of secondary to that, if that makes sense. Um, but then and Derek, I'd, I'd open it up to also what you think and have to offer. Right, Derek. Yeah, uh, Mariana, I think you said it pretty well. Um, you know, a lot of this work um, is through partnerships with other agencies and folks that have more of those specialties, right? <clears throat> but in regards to connecting to the Richmond Land Trust, um, I mean, I would love to uh, get to know what they've been doing on the ground level because we are working with like Happy Lot Farm and Urban Tilth and folks on the Greenway. So, you know, and especially Daniel and Tanya and Rachel, like, you know, they're present, you know, within Richmond. So, um, you know, I think as we develop this, this grant program and this uh, current and future farmers training, we'll definitely be, um, you know, looking towards groups like the Richmond Land Trust to like connect the right person to the right place. I don't think I have much to add much have much to add to either of that i agree with all of it yeah thank you um igor well thank you so much for this uh very uh, meaningful presentation um for some of us who have been involved with our city for a really long time this is uh, some fairly uncomfortable stuff to confront and uh, I think this is a very important initial step to to do that. And the uh, purpose being not to just beat ourselves up and, and say what kind of bad people we've been doing all this stuff, just to recognize reality and to see this is where we are, this is not where we wanna be and how do we get to where we wanna be. And uh, I think this uh, approach of uh, not riding in an armored uh, vehicle and say, okay, here's how we're going to do this, but using, as you said earlier, numerous times, uh, listen first. It's uh, something to really uh, keep remembering as we progress uh, along trying to make change like this uh, happen. Uh, it becomes more like we're, we're, we're facilitating social change, social betterment as well as agricultural and environmental. And as you, as you can point out that it's not separate. And so uh, I just wanna make sure that you know that I'm very much supportive of this. I'm very, very grateful that we're approaching the, uh, this whole issue in this holistic and, and fairly fundamental way, rather than just writing in with a bunch of 
okay, here's good management practices you can apply and put a hedgerow here and we'll do contour plowing over here and do a seasonal grazing over here and everything will be fine. Now, those things are all very important and they're, they're part of the way we actually get to where we want to be, but they're insufficient. And I think uh, we've kind of opened the door now to recognizing that and, and approaching these things in a way that really will make a, a lasting difference. So um, in, my, in my early 80s now, and I'm hoping to live long enough to see some of this come to fruition, but I can, uh, I can be glad to know that uh, we're moving in the right direction and uh, whether I get to see it or not in my lifetime, uh, I, it's uh, a comforting thing to know that uh, we're headed in the right direction in a way that uh, is positive and helpful. So thanks again. I'm so happy this call is being recorded. That was really beautiful. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I think it's, um, I, I completely agree. I think uh, it's one of the reasons why I really wanted to have these folks um, come speak to the forum because it is something that I think people need to think about some more. And, um, you know, it's it's all well and good. People, people will definitely get on board with cover cropping or whatever kind of practices you want them to do. But if you don't, if, if you don't have the money to, to institute that or to buy the seed, what's the what's the benefit right so um i'm really glad that we have some really practical people thinking about these things and trying to solve these problems um does anyone else have any questions for the group before we adjourn well thank you all so very much and um i really look forward to our next meeting and um please just stay safe and um stay as dry as you can thank you all